Hello everyone and welcome to today's Mondak webinar in association with Shahata and Partners who will be providing an insightful webinar on the fintech landscape in Egypt. My name is Dan Sampeo and I'm joined by the brilliant Ibrahim Shahata to take us through today's discussion. Ibrahim Shahata has accumulated more than a decade of experience in the Egyptian market. Ibrahim started off his career focusing on corporate law where he successfully advised several multinational companies on doing business in Egypt. Being involved in the Egyptian renewable energy market since 2014, he developed a niche experience which makes him one of the leading lawyers in the field. Moreover, Ibrahim has been recognized in the last few years as one of the key players in the entrepreneurial ecosystem through working with more than 60 startups and several, several venture capital firms. In this regard, Ibrahim has helped both VC firms and startups navigate the legal issues that always arise in this specific realm and guide them to be more investment ready. Before we begin today's webinar, a quick housekeeping item. You can submit questions to Ibrahim by typing them into the questions pane of the toolbar on the right hand side of your page. And we do um, encourage you to get those questions in. It's now my pleasure to hand you over to Ibrahim to begin. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello everyone, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, this uh, webinar is uh, dedicated to discussing the legal framework of uh, fintech uh, uh, industry in Egypt. Uh, in this uh, webinar, we'll try to uh, give more, uh, some holistic uh, ideas about the industry and uh, to discuss it in, in, on both like a holistic level and also in detail uh, for certain um, you know, uh, categories of, of this industry. Um, so um, let me start by uh, trying to discuss um, the, the, the uh, discuss the fintech industry in Egypt on a holistic uh, uh, on a holistic level first. So in Egypt, um, can uh, Aaron can can we go back? Uh, I will just uh, yeah. So in Egypt, there are two main regulators for the fintech industry. Um, there is the Central Bank of Egypt and there is the Financial Regulatory Authority. Uh, the Central Bank of Egypt is responsible for regulating fintech uh, and uh, uh, like, you know, uh, fintech activities related to the banking sector, while the FRE is, uh, which is the Financial Regulatory Authority, is responsible for regulating fintech companies uh, uh, in respect of non-banking activities. So uh, for the Central Bank of Egypt, there has been uh, a change of laws uh, since 2020, the, the new banking law was issued. Uh, unfortunately, the executive regulations haven't been issued yet, but there are some specific regulations that have been issued for a certain type of uh, uh, of like issues relating to fintech in in the realm of the banking sector. Uh, while on the other hand, the FRA has issued the fintech law for non-banking activities in 2022, and several regulations have been issued already uh, relating to uh, fintech uh, companies in in, in that uh, realm. Uh, when we talk, I will talk about uh, 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 the Central Bank of Egypt first, like, you know, uh, the first category of uh, uh, fintech companies in, in, in that realm is uh, basically digital banks. So, Aaron, can we go to the next slide? Yes. So, um, as you're talking, uh, uh, the fintech uh, uh, in relation, the fintech industry under the banking sector, the main uh, category is basically digital banks. And in 2023, there has been issued uh, specific regulations for digital banks in Egypt, specifying uh, certain conditions uh, that any applicant has to comply with in order to uh, obtain the license. Uh, if we go to the next slide, you will show you will see some of the uh, 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 like conditions. I will uh, brief them here. Uh, so basically, the the capital is uh, one of the most important conditions here, and it's basically. Uh, around $60 million, uh, the equivalent of $60 million, whether you do it through uh, uh, incorporating an Egyptian subsidiary uh, in the form of a joint stock company, or you incorporate it through a branch of a foreign uh, digital uh, bank. Uh, also, one of the uh, important conditions is that, you know, the shareholding structure must have a financial institution that owns at least 30% of the bank capital. The definition of financial institution uh, and determining whether 
a, a certain like you know institution is considered a financial institution is subject of course to the discretionary power of the central bank of egypt there are, there is a list uh, uh, for what is considered as a financial institution by the central bank of egypt but especially if if, if that financial institution is not based in Egypt, then uh, it will be subject to the discretionary power of uh, the Central Bank of Egypt. Uh, other conditions relate to the experience that uh, has to be possessed by uh, uh, by the uh, uh, the people running the bank and the board of directors and 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 and, and, and other uh, key personnel in the digital bank. Uh, also, uh, if you can go to the next slide, Aaron, you will see that uh, there are certain conditions relating to. Uh, gen more generic level, like saying that the licensing shouldn't be incompatible with the economic interests of, this, of the Egyptian state. Of course, there must be submission of a feasibility study, and also uh, there must be uh, like you know uh, no uh, violation of any uh, antitrust or anti-competition uh, rules. Um, uh, then, if we go to the next slide, you will see more uh, conditions for uh, uh, for foreign digital banks or Egyptian. Uh, subsidiaries of foreign digital uh, or for uh, foreign financial institutions. Uh, it relates to uh, defining the, the the headquarters, the nationality of the headquarters. Also, uh, uh, one of the most important things is providing a proof of credit rating from a global uh, credit agency uh, like uh, Moody's or Fitch Ratings or S&P. So that's uh, uh, that's for the digital uh, banks. Uh, basically, uh, we understand that there are some. Uh, applicants that are currently in the process, but we haven't heard yet of anyone obtaining the license just yet. We are, we, we, we believe, or we understand that there are some applicants who are about to get the license, but no license has been issued yet in, in that sector. Um, so uh, this is, uh, I would say this is, this license is, for me, is considered the only license that, you know, we have uh, clarity over its regulations uh, uh, in, uh, within the banking sector. Uh, the, the rest of the license mostly uh, relate to FRA and the non-banking sector. So uh, these licenses uh, will be uh, that we will talk about uh, will be the SME finance, the microfinance, the nano finance, the consumer finance, and the robo advisory uh, uh, license as well. Um, so in the next slide or the next slides generally, we'll talk about uh, uh, the licensing requirements for these companies uh, generally. So uh, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, the, the, the law um, uh, specifies certain requirements in terms of capital requirements or in terms of shareholding structure or in terms of operating requirements and so forth. But uh, at the end of, of all of these slides, I will provide an update on uh, uh, what's so-called the temporary license that is offered for startups in the fintech sector uh, uh, for uh, non-banking activities. And we will specify what conditions uh, need to be complied with as a minimum in order to obtain this uh, temporary uh, license. It's a two-year uh, temporary license. So uh, just to be clear, like, so all we're talk, going to talk about in terms of capital requirements or in terms of, like, you know, uh, shareholding structure that is required for all of the next uh, set of licenses, these are the general conditions. These are the regular conditions. And at the end, I will specify what are uh, is the exceptional routes that is offered for uh, uh, startups in, in that regard. <clears throat> so the SME license, it's, uh, 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 it's the license for uh, financing S uh, small and medium enterprises. So we, we have the license for financing small and medium enterprises separate from the license uh, uh, for financing micro uh, 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 enterprises. So uh, for the small and medium enterprises, uh, uh, what, co what is considered small and what is considered medium uh, is something that is uh, specified by law, and we will discuss that later. But generally, if we go to the next slide, Aaron, you will see that you know that the company has uh, to uh, uh, to uh, uh, attain certain conditions. Uh, the first one of them is to be in the form of a joint stock company. Uh, another one of them is uh, uh, that uh, uh, the founders of the company must be legal entities, meaning like corporate entities, juridical pers persons, not natural persons. So 50% of the, ca the company capital has to be owned by uh, corporate entities. And 25% of the company capital has to be owned by financial institution. Uh, and there is a decree issued by the FRA specifying what is considered a financial institution. So this includes banks, insurance companies, uh, 
includes uh, VC uh, venture capital firms, private equity firms, includes a lot of things. And if it is if this institution is based abroad, uh, then uh, some documentation uh, would be required to prove the status of this uh, of this entity uh, abroad. Uh, so, for example, uh, if it's uh, if it's uh, like uh, a venture capital firm, you would need to provide like the, the license of this. VC firm and it has to be obtained or it has to be issued by a, a regulator that on the same level of the FRA or the Central Bank of Egypt. Uh, uh, other sets of conditions, if we go to the next slide, uh, the minimum capital uh, is 75 uh, million uh, Egyptian pounds. Uh, if we do the math, I think it will be uh, in dollars, uh, 75 divided by 50, it will be around 1.5 million dollars. Uh, and uh, and that's not uh, a, a small number by any means. But as you will see uh, at the end, there is an exception uh, out of uh, so that would decrease this number to be uh, only 15 million Egyptian pound, uh, which is uh, around $300,000. Uh, uh, if uh, if uh, you apply for a temporary license rather than the general or the permanent license. And to be uh, clear here, the, this capital has to be fully issued and paid up at the time of the incorporation. So it's not uh, it's not that you just like you know pay a certain percentage out of it at the time of, uh, of incorporation and complete it later on. You it has to be fully paid at the time of uh, incorporation. Uh, also, another condition is relating to the personnel that will be running the company and that they will have they must have appropriate experience and good reputation in accordance with the FRA uh, regulations. Uh, if we go to the next slide, you will see a, what is considered a medium-sized project or a medium enterprise and a small enterprise. So these are the, the, the companies that will be financed by uh, the applicant who will apply for the uh, uh, SME financing license. So he can only finance these projects. So uh, for medium-sized projects, it's projects that has uh, an annual earning between 50 and 20, uh, 200 million uh, Egyptian pounds. And uh, uh, so it's, it's, it's one of the three metrics. Uh, if it's uh, if it has like you know uh, annual earnings then then uh, and it has been running for for a period then that's okay. If it's a newly incorporated entity, uh, it depends. If it's an industrial project, so the capital has to be between five and fifteen million. And if it's a non-industrial project, the capital has to be th between three and uh, five million. Uh, as for the small uh, size project, the annual earnings is to be between one to fifty million Egyptian pound. And if it's a new uh, incorporated company. If it is industrial, it will be uh, between uh, uh, 50,000 to uh, uh, 5 million. And if it's a non-industrial project, it will be between 50,000 to 3 million. Uh, uh, so that's for the SME licensing. Uh, for the microfinance uh, licensing, which is the next slide, uh, uh, it's a little bit different uh, 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 in terms of uh, the target companies. So you will find the conditions for the license are very much similar to the SME license. But what is different between the two licenses is who would be your target uh, portfolio. In the SMEs, it will be just small and medium enterprises. And in the microfinance, it will be micro uh, uh, enterprises only. But if you go to the next slide, you will see that it's also has to be a joint stock company, has to be owned 50% by uh, a juridical person. 25% by financial institutions. It has to have 75 million Egyptian pound of issued and paid up uh, capital as well. Uh, what is uh, interesting is that in order to uh, to get a nano uh, license or to get like nano financing uh, license, you have to get the microfinance license first. So the nano finance is not considered as a license per se, but it's considered as an additional product that you can add on uh, to your microfinance license. So if we go to the next slide, you will see that nano finance is uh, limited in terms of like the, the, the amount of the loan. It has to be 3,000 Egyptian pound per borrower. Uh, also, uh, 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 it has uh, the, 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 the repayment period has to be uh, not more than uh, 90 days. And what is important that, you know, the purpose of the loan has to be an economic uh, purpose. And this is applies to the SME, to the microfinance, to the nano finance all these three uh, types of, of products or licenses, the purpose of the loan has to be an economic one. So it doesn't apply to personal loans specifically. Um, if we go to the next slide, you will see that, you know, 
uh, uh, as we said, there is no uh, uh, a specific regime for it. So in, in other words, you have to get the microfinance license first, and which has to have a capital of 75 million Egyptian pound, and then add on it the nano finance uh, uh, product per se. <clears throat> Uh, so uh, the conditions that are specific to the nano finance license are more uh, 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 like you know on the operation side. So it's relating to having an electronic risk management system with the customer data. Uh, also certain rules about like you know advertising and disclosures. Uh, also uh, the specific requirement for having an insurance uh, uh, policy covering at least 25% of the nano finance uh, portfolio at the end of each month. If you go to the next slide, uh, uh, you, we have to uh, the, the nano finance applicant has to use uh, efficient methods uh, in order to monitor the customer uh, debts and to handle uh, late payments as well. And also, if the uh, the loan is above 500 Egyptian pound, it has to have it has to run a credit scoring check uh, by an S, uh, by a by an entity that is licensed by uh, the Central Bank of Egypt. And also the last thing is that you have to update customer uh, uh, data and credit status every two weeks uh, with the uh, credit information agency as well. And these are some of the requirements. There are the other requirements as well. Uh, uh, so um, uh, so these are, uh, I would say, the core requirements for uh, running and operating an annual finance uh, company. And, then we go to the next slide where we discuss the consumer finance. The consumer finance is a separate scheme, and here I have to uh, uh, to talk about uh, to, to to make clear uh, two things. So the consumer finance license uh, uh, that we're talking about here in the slides is more the the company that is doing only financing. But under the law, there is a, another regime that applies to uh, companies that produce products, co produce consumer products. So these companies who produce consumer products are uh, eligible or are, uh, um, let's say not are eligible, are required to obtain a license, uh, a consumer finance license, if they are going to finance the sale of their products themselves, uh, subject to certain conditions. So basically, if they are going to have a portfolio where they finance uh, products uh, produced or distributed by them with an amount of above 25 million Egyptian pound, then they are required to obtain a license from the FRA to be able to do their business on that uh, specific uh, uh, financing uh, portfolio. But otherwise, if you are a company that is doing only financing, I'm not producing, I'm not distributing, distributing any products, then I'm required to get a license as long as the term of the loan is above uh, six months. Uh, and here, if we go to the next slide, you will find also that the minimum uh, issued and paid up capital is 75 million uh, Egyptian pound. Also, it has to be like 50% owned by juridical persons, 25% owned by a financial institution. Other requirements also relate to having the managing director and the key personnel uh, meeting the uh, qualifications and the requirements uh, for experience as set by the FRA. Also, it requires like some uh, uh, technological and some uh, information systems infrastructure as well. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the last, uh, uh, if we go to the next slide, you will see the last, uh, 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 like, you know, uh, uh, license that we're going to talk about, and that's uh, the Robo Advisory. The Robo Advisory license is, is, uh, is, a, is a license that can be obtained by the company that is uh, operating and managing uh, 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 investment portfolios. So if, if they are going to do uh, 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 the investment and, uh, and do the management of the investment through using uh, robotic or like AI or any like you know kind of like you know uh, solutions uh, algorithms similar to that, then they would have to get specific license for that, and that license has certain requirements as you can see in the uh, next slide. Uh, these requirements uh, are uh, having an issued and paid up capital of at least 15 million Egyptian pound, and also uh, the same uh, rules applies with respect to like you know having a competent team. Uh, uh, as per the, uh, uh, the regulations of the FRA, and also have the uh, competent and, uh, and uh, eligible technological infrastructure as required by uh, the FRA. Uh, so, so to summarize the, 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 what we have said in, in the past, uh, is uh, basically like uh, if you go to the 
SME license, the microfinance license, and the consumer finance license, you will find that the capital is 75 million Egyptian pound to be fully paid at the time of the incorporation. Uh, as we said, the nano finance is just a product, not a separate license. The digital banks, it's $60 million, and the robo advisory is 15 million Egyptian pound. And uh, if you go uh, all over these, like, you know, uh, uh, licenses, all of them requires a 25% uh, 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 ownership by financial institution, except for the digital banks, which requires that to be 30% uh, and not 25%. You will also find that they're, all of them requires that the management and the key personnel must have the sufficient uh, experience and uh, 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 expertise that is required by the FRA or the Central Bank region, depending on the situation. Um, I will talk about two uh, additional topics. One of them is specifically for the FRA licenses. So that applies to all of the above licenses except for the digital bank. And then I will talk about the regime for sandboxes, whether that is the case for the Central Bank of Egypt or for the FRA. So uh, in 2022, uh, uh, there has been issued a, a new uh, law uh, for FinTech. Uh, for uh, the FRA that regulates uh, fintech activities for non-banking uh, uh, sector. And in, under, after that law was issued, there has been uh, a, rule, uh, uh, um, a regulation that was issued in 2023 that um, uh, provides the ability for companies, uh, to, uh, basically startup companies, to apply for a two-year uh, temporary license. In order to do that, it has to, have, uh, uh, it has to take the form of a joint stock company it has to have a minimum uh, issued and paid up capital of 15 million Egyptian pound, which is around $300,000. That's instead of the 75 million Egyptian pound that is usually set uh, for uh, the regular license. So it's like $300,000 instead of $1.5 million. So that's a big uh, uh, gap, which is really encouraging for startups. 25% uh, of the company must be owned by technology or uh, fintech specialists. 25% of the company must be owned by a financial institution. And of course, some, uh, uh, there could be some overlap between these two, uh, uh, these two requirements. So if it's like, you know, for example, um, uh, uh, a financial institution that is in the fintech industry, then it will, uh, you will need just one company and it will be owning only 25%. Also 50% has to be owned by juridical persons. Uh, another important requirement that shows that this mostly applies to startup is that the financing of the company must be backed by venture capital firms that are licensed either in Egypt or uh, abroad. Um, in terms of operation, one of the main, uh, one of the most important requirements uh, is that uh, the leverage of these startup companies cannot exceed four times the startup equity during the period of the temporary license, which is uh, two years. <clears throat> Um, lastly, uh, so, so uh, as you can see, um, uh, there's a big uh, in advantage for startups uh, to apply for that temporary license. Uh, this enabled them the ability to um, do uh, a bit of work for the period of two years before engaging in like full-fledged services. Uh, and at the same time, they don't have to abide by uh, stringent uh, requirements, especially in terms of the uh, required capital. Uh, lastly, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about the sandboxes. So a sandbox is like, you know, the regime that was uh, uh, inaugurated in Egypt. First, uh, it started with the Central Bank of Egypt in 2019. And then last year, uh, the FRA started also its own uh, sandbox. So the uh, sandbox of the CBE is, of the Central Bank of Egypt is different a little bit than the one by the FRA. Of course, uh, uh, this uh, the sandbox for the Central Bank of Egypt is uh, concerned mostly with banking activities. Uh, and the FRA is mostly concerned with non-banking activities. But the problem is that many activities are considered like, you know, banking or non-banking, like what is the fine line between this and that? This especially uh, sometimes causes problems and makes, uh, makes it not easy to determine which sandbox should be the one I apply to. Uh, of course, it's, uh, the sandbox of the Central Bank of Egypt was created in 2019, so it was the only opportunity for any fintech to apply to. So that's made like many non-banking fintechs apply to the CBE at the time. 
uh, and that uh, uh, we don't know how it, things will be uh, now after the FRA also created its own uh, sandbox. Um, the CBE uh, also is different than the FR, uh, the CBE sandbox is also different than the, the FRA sandbox. The CBE sandbox um, uh, does it in terms of like, you know, uh, specialized cohorts. So they announced that, you know, we're going to take like a cohort for EKYC only. We're going to take a cohort for the ROSCA, uh, 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 you know, applications only. We're going to take a cohort for the advanced payment, uh, advanced salary payment uh, 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 solutions, uh, for example. But the FRA is more generic and um, there has been some changes in it uh, within that year. So first, it started as a sandbox under the umbrella of the Egyptian Stock Exchange. And then I think uh, last month, uh, they have changed that and they made it, uh, made it directly linked to the FRA and not to the Egyptian uh, Stock Exchange. Uh, the rules of the FRA sandbox are not clear yet. They haven't been issued yet. Uh, it is mentioned in the FinTech law that this is uh, an available regime to test, uh, uh, to test uh, like, you know, uh, products before, like, you know, uh, getting the license, whether it's temporary or a, a, a regular license. But uh, as we said, it's, uh, it's still unclear to us how the FRA will be running its sandbox uh, uh, starting uh, this period. Uh, some companies have been able to get the, uh, have, have been able to graduate from the sandboxes and have been able to operate, uh, especially from the Central Bank uh, of Egypt. And this is usually good news because this makes it, uh, uh, makes it uh, like, you know, paves the way for startups to go and innovate and make sure that the fintech industry is growing uh, in Egypt. Um, I think that's, uh, 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 that's mostly like, you know, um, uh, what I wanted to talk about. I would love to get some questions first and then we can uh, uh, go over like, you know, uh, more uh, insights in the fending industry in Egypt and how it has been growing over the past four or five years in, an, uh, in a very uh, excessive and uh, uh, accelerating manner. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. And, and just before we move to our Q&A section, I'd like to say thank you very much for your insights and presentation. Um, there are a lot of information to get through, so we really appreciate um, your time today, Ibrahim. I will say to our audience as we move to our Q&A section, we have 30 minutes now, so um, we do have time if you have a question uh, to get that answered. So please do send send your question in. It's not a fantastic opportunity to, to have that answered by our expert, Ibrahim, today. Um, Ibrahim, I, I first want to ask you about microfinance and nanofinance. Uh, does the applicant need to get the microfinance license first to practice the nanofinance activity? Uh, yes, so, so the process goes as follows. Uh, you apply first for the uh, microfinance license and then uh, you, uh, after that you would be able to add the nanofinance license as uh, a product uh, 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 for your uh, company, for, the, your, for basically your microfinance uh, license. Uh, the thing is that there's no many companies that have done that. I think uh, I know of only one company that was able to get the nanofinance product attached to their microfinance license. It's a still a, a very uh, untapped market. Uh, and to be honest, um, I think like this is one of the areas that I've got asked about a lot. And one of the problems in that sector is that the law requires that the, that the finance to be for an economic purpose. And that's not usually how it is the case outside of Egypt. So nano loans are usually given without validating or verifying the purpose of the loan. And usually they are, they're, they're, they, they, they are given uh, for, um, uh, for uh, uh, like personal reasons and uh, uh, more akin to consumer finance. But if you go to the consumer finance law, you will find that it only applies when the term of the loan is above six months and the nano finance is usually term the term of the nanofinance loan is usually like less than that, much less than that. 
So that's what makes it like, you know, a little bit of a gray area, uh, whether uh, uh, you would be able to like, you know, whether you're required to get a license for offering nano personal loans and whether that would be considered uh, something outside the non-banking sector altogether and something that is you might be exposed to the central bank of Egypt, for example. This is still one of the things that hasn't been figured out completely by the Egyptian uh, authorities, to be honest. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. Um, are there special rules for fintech companies using technology um, different to the traditional licensing schemes? Uh, yes, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, there's two uh, routes. There's the traditional route where you get the license. Uh, um, uh, you can call it the fintech license or it's the, the, the finance license. And that's like where you get the license for its like original term, which is usually like, you know, let's say five years, for example, and get renewed. But then like if you are a fintech company, you can you have one of two options. You can if you have the capital requirements and all that, you can apply for the regular license and that's it. And if you don't and if you're only startup or you are like, you know, a, a new entrant to the market or a foreign like institution that want to test a little bit, then there is the option of applying for the temporary license regime which is a two-year regime uh, with uh, less requirements, especially in terms of um, uh, capital required to be paid up at the time of incorporation. So here it's 15 instead of 75. So it's like, if you go for the regular license, it's five times the temporary license. Brilliant, thank you again, Ibrahim. Um, we have a question here. Would companies that produce consumer products and sell them in installments be subject to any rules concerning consumer finance regulations? Yes, so, so consumer finance is, uh, is as follows, like, you know, it's either you are financing only or you are, uh, are uh, 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 producing consumer products uh, or distributing consumer products and you want to finance, to, to, to offer financing solutions as well to your consumers. So if you are just financing only, then you are required to get, uh, 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 to have a certain capital, which is 75 million Egyptian pounds. And uh, you have to apply uh, for the consumer finance license, the regular license. If you're not, and you're just a producer, uh, then it depends how much is your financing portfolio. If it is below 25 million Egyptian pounds per year, then you are not, required to do anything or apply for any license. If it is this number, 25 million or above, then you are required to get a license for offering that financing financing solution to your consumers. So uh, so there are rules for that. And uh, some of them, some some of these companies have, have tried to obtain that license already. Brilliant, Ibrahim. We've had um, two further questions come in from the audience, which you should be able to see um, in our chat function, Ibrahim. Um, the first question being fairly broad, um, so I don't know if you want to speak around it a little bit, um, but how is blockchain technology being utilized in Egypt? Um, that's, that's a good question. Um, so, um... The FinTech law that was issued by the FRA has specific mention of blockchain technology which and smart contracts as well, which means that um, FinTech solutions that are going to use blockchain technologies shouldn't be facing any problems. But as you can see, uh, blockchain is, 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 is a wide acronym or a wide definition. So there's, if we're talking about blockchain, there's, there's the private blockchain and the public blockchain. And if we go to the public realm and cryptos and all that, then you will find that this, anything relating to cryptocurrencies is regulated by the digital bank, by the, by the central bank of Egypt. And anything relating to that is requiring, requires a license in Egypt. So, um, so that's for the crypto side. But if you're going to do authentic solution for with a private based blockchain, for example, private to private, and it's not like, you know, open to the public, then that's fine. And that's certainly okay. And it is recognized by the Egyptian uh, by the Egyptian um, government 
through the fenticlaw. Uh, of course, uh, uh, some other issues are relating to blockchain technology, especially in terms of data protection. And uh, uh, the data protection law has been issued in Egypt since quite some time, since 2020. But the executive regulations haven't been issued yet, and there might be some uh, issues concerning the use of data on blockchain platforms in the executive regulations. So this is something that we'll wait to see uh, in the future. Excellent. Thank you very much, um, Ibrahim. And, and what measures are in place to ensure consumer protection um, in, the fintech, in the fintech industry? Uh, so there's a consumer protection law and there are uh, consumer uh, protection specific regulations uh, that are issued by the uh, CBE and the FRA. So there is the main umbrella uh, of consumer protection law and there is a specific umbrella that is applicable to the banking sector through the regulations issued by the Central Bank of Egypt. I think they were issued in 2019 and there is also specific regulations for consumer protection in, in the fintech industry specifically that have been uh, uh, that were part of the fintech law that was issued by the FRA for the non-banking activities. So basically, like you know, there are some cross-referencing, for example, uh, with data uh, protection. So, for example, the fintech law uh, refers back to the data protection law, whereby uh, you need the ex usually you need the explicit consent of uh, the data subject to be able to uh, to be enabled to process their data. Um, and you need to uh, be clear on the purpose of the processing. And there are several regulations in the data protection law. Some of them also relate to the transfer of data outside of Egypt. Uh, some of them relate to the sensitive data and how uh, uh, you, you don't just need the consent, but you uh, also need the license if you're going to process it. Uh, and uh, also the transfer of data abroad needs uh, usually um, a license uh, in any case, and if it is to a country that is less safer than Egypt uh, or less safer than the metrics deployed by the regulators in Egypt, then you will need also the explicit consent of the data subject. So there are many rules in the data protection law that are being referenced or incorporated by reference in the fintech law. And also there are specific rules on uh, smart contracts as well, uh, because this is a different regime than regular contracting and how the consumer has to be protected in, the, uh, protected in that regard. And there are some other, some other rules on consumer protection uh, generally in the fintech uh, uh, law issued by the FRA. Excellent, thank you, Ibrahim. Um, we've had a very good question in from the audience here. Um, what would you consider as some of the key challenges faced by fintech in terms of marketing their services? Are there any concerns raised by fintech users regarding the agreement between fintech's marketing promises and the actual services offered to clients? And I'll give you some time to oh. read that. And yeah. And you do it. yeah. Perfect. Go ahead. Thank you. I think this is also uh, part of the consumer protection, like. Uh, question as well. So there are some metrics. Uh, the data protection law also have some provisions on uh, direct digital marketing and how you can do that without violating uh, uh, the sanctity and the privacy of the, of the data subjects. So there are some rules on that. As I said, the, the, the law was issued, but the executive regulations haven't been issued yet, which will specify more in detail how you can do uh, uh, generally digital, direct digital marketing, whether it's for uh, uh, fintech or, or in other industries. Um, uh, but uh, for example, if if you uh, if you go back, you, uh, if we go back to certain licenses like the Nano Finance license, because it is targeting a, a very um, niche market that is usually uh, like unbanked, uh, maybe a little bit uneducated, and all that you'll see specific rules on the advertisements that are being done in that industry and how they can be uh, done without like making or while making sure that uh, no none of the public is being abused or is being like given false promises and that they understand very well how uh, the interest rate will be applied and all that. Uh, but that's, uh, and, and also if you go to the Central Bank of Egypt, 
Of course, these are uh, general rules that apply to any uh, banking activities, but they also apply to fintech industry. Uh, and as you, as we, we were saying in the in the banking sector, it's only digital banks for now. But there might be other uh, uh, things that will be uh, integrated in the future in in in, in that realm uh, as well. So um, so so generally, I can say that in order to make sure that you comply uh, with with the laws. You need to check the general law on consumer protection, the general law on data protection, uh, the general regulations for consumer protections uh, uh, in the CBE and the FRA, and then specific rules for each license. Because, as I said, in the nano finance, for example, there are specific rules on advertisements and disclaimers. So you have to check all that uh, to make sure that you are fully uh, compliant. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Ibrahim. Um, for the time being, that's the last question. That we've had in there's so another far. question i think before that that we didn't answer you're correct ibrahim you're correct how do you see the landscape in egypt evolving over the next few years given these sandboxes which i think refers to an earlier point you made uh so um for example like if we talk about the sandbox of the central bank of egypt this was issued in uh, this started in 2019 and we can see already like some uh uh, fintechs that have uh, benefited from that, like uh, Khazna, Gamaya. So Khazna is a, an advanced uh, salary uh, payment solution that is very uh, prominent in Egypt right now. Gamaya is a Roska model. Uh, I don't know if you know the Roska model, but it's basically like, you know, um, it's very popular in Egypt, but it's basically uh, like, you know, five friends, like, you know, meeting each other. Uh, each one, like, you know, four of them pitching, like, for example, each one is pitching 10,000 Egyptian pounds, so that's 40. The fifth will take it now, and then in, in a month, he will pay, and the other three will pay, and it's like, it's by, it's like enabling, like, you know, uh, sort of a savings scheme, like, you know, I pay 10,000 now, and then, like, I get it, like, 40 or 50, in, like, in five months, and, uh, and that's also a very prominent application in Egypt. I think also Money Follows went through, which is the same application, went through the sandbox. So what I'm trying to say here is that the, the benefits of the Central Bank of Egypt sandbox uh, have uh, have been realized for some time now. There are also a couple of very prominent applications for EQIC, uh, Digify and Valify. I think they went also through the sandbox of the Central Bank of Egypt. Uh, and also the, these EQIC companies, I think one of them went uh, through the, the FRA sandbox as well to be able to service both the banking industry and the non-banking uh, industry as well. So, uh, so the, the sandboxes will have a um, uh, big uh, impact on, on, on the fintech industry at large. Uh, I think what's missing is more uh, structuring to these uh, sandboxes and to be uh, like as you can see like for example in the uae there has been an update that made the, the the regulations very clear if you go here to egypt there are no specific regulations for the fra yet there are some specific regulations for the sp for the central bank of egypt but i think like they need to be updated a little bit because there are have been issued since 2019 so i think some updates given the the uh, the evolving nature of fintech everywhere uh, is, is is required as well so if we do that, that will help a lot. Um, and to be honest, it's not only about regulatory issues, but also the economic conditions of the Egyptian market help, uh, would help a lot if they get improved. Uh, Egypt has been through a series of um, uh, devaluations since 2022 till uh, March 2024. So within a period of two years, we found we found we were faced with a situation where the Egyptian pound like got like I think. Uh, it was 50 uh, it's one dollar was 15 egyptian down, pound now one dollar is 50 egyptian pounds so that's a big uh, decrease in the egyptian pound value and this is something that um uh, hinders the economic ability of the economy at all uh, at large like not only like the fintech industry but but all other industries uh, and the uh, fintech industry would uh, be it, uh, one of them specifically because like it's not um, it's not exporting anything it's all within the Egyptian market so it will be always exposed to the Egyptian currency devaluation because they are doing the loans in Egyptian pounds no one is doing the loans in USD here to the Egyptian mass so uh, so uh, of course any devaluation would 
affect these uh, fintech companies, especially if they are startups, they might be uh, bankrupt, got, get bankrupt, or they might be facing uh, problems with fundraising, which has been the issue uh, for some time now. And uh, that made uh, uh, many of the Egyptian startups try to uh, branch out of Egypt and go to Saudi or the UAE or other uh, countries in the region to be able to make it work and balance the situation with Egypt. So, um, so to 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 be to summarize, like uh, now it's been it's better. The situation is better. Uh, we as a law firm are getting more requests for uh, fintechs uh, trying to operate in Egypt, uh, uh, foreign companies and Egyptian companies, which is a good sign. Uh, but it's also not like two years ago, like before the devaluation. Still, we didn't go back to the time where we were getting requests every every week or every two weeks. It's still it's still not uh, like that. But we hope that the situation gets better and better. There is a new government in place. Uh, there has been a change in the in the Ministry of Finance, and uh, uh, there has been a change of, uh, a year before in, in in the head of the FRA and the head of the CBE as well. So um, I think we are on the right track, but I think we just need some some momentum and some um, uh, I would say like you know accelerate try to to accelerate the progress a little bit. Excellent, fantastic answer, Ibrahim. Thank you very much. I think that that is the end now um, of the questions that we've had in so far. Um, if you do have a question and you want to reach out directly to Ibrahim please do, we will be sharing Ibrahim's contact information. So please get in touch with the firm for any further questions that you might have. Um, for now, Ibrahim, what I want to do is just offer you the opportunity for give us any other points that you want to make or perhaps give us some key takeaways that you'd like our audience um, to leave today's session with before we finish. Uh, uh... Of course. Um, so for me, uh, uh, I would say like I would like to say a few points. Uh, one of them is that um, the fintech industry is still not um, a fully regulated. I would say. I'm. What I'm trying to say is that there are some gray areas in in the fintech industry, and uh, some untapped areas as well. Uh, uh, for example, I would give an example on that uh, because the consumer finance law specifies that the term of the loan is six months and above. There are some companies that are offering BMPL solutions for terms less than six months and they are not regulated at all. And of course, unregulated means less uh, cost and less uh, supervision and all that. Um, and they are doing very well, actually. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that maybe sometimes um, uh, as a, uh, in order to be able to, uh, to go to the blue ocean and escape the red ocean, you might try to think deep to find a, a place where you can operate with, uh, with minimum regulations, I would say. So this is one point. Another point would be that um, uh, uh, there is an opportunity for startups indeed uh in the fintech industry especially with the regulations of the fra uh i think for me if i'm a startup i will try first to apply for a sandbox and if that works then i will apply for the temporary license and if that works then i apply for, for the full license uh even if i do have the money up front you know even if i do have the million or two million dollars in advance to pay the full paid up capital for 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 a regular license i wouldn't do that uh, and this is just to, to, to be on the cautious side and to make sure that I don't um, uh, like uh, I, I'm not exposed as much to the uh, 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 I would say the, the uh, varying economic conditions that you can find yourself at in Egypt. It's still I would say we're not fully stable economy. Uh, we have been exposed to several external shocks, whether it's Corona or whether it's the Russian-Ukrainian war or whether it's the Gaza war or whether it's other things as well. So that's why you have to be cautious uh, in that uh, sense. Uh, third thing is that uh, for foreign companies, 
they have to uh, to try and partner up with some Egyptian entrepreneurs to make it work. I would say like, you know, having someone on the ground is key, especially if it's someone who's well connected and well uh, respected in the industry. And, and this is something that I, I would see, and this is advice that doesn't apply only to, 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 to the FinTech. I think it applies to many uh, ventures as well. Um, it's not a requirement to have an Egyptian manager anymore uh, under the Egyptian law, but uh, it is, uh, but it is uh, uh, a recommended practice. And you can uh, put in place enough metrics to make sure that there is no abuse of power by, by that Egyptian manager as well. That's something that you can do. And you can do that by hiring a good lawyer and a good auditor uh, as well. Um, other things, uh, I would say like we have published several like uh, Fentech um, uh, uh, guides uh, on Legal 500 and Chambers and Partners. Uh, you, you can find them uh, online easily. Uh, they have like a lot of information on, on the industry uh, at a macro level and at a micro level as well. Uh, uh, we as a firm, we try to provide uh, preliminary information as, as much as possible uh, on, on a, on a, uh, uh, without uh, charging uh, fees to, to enable people to understand more because from my perspective, this is a very um, new market. And you, we, as a law firm, we are uh, required to do some of some form of education to enable uh, uh, people to understand more and make an informed decision about their uh, potential investments in, in that sector in uh, in Egypt. Um, what else? I, I think that's these are the most of the, most of the things that I want to talk about. Um, just be aware that there is always an update every now and then. So. So you need to check the latest regulations every now yeah. because they are they get amended a lot in Egypt. Yeah, and I'm sure our audience can come to you, Ibrahim, to keep uh, um, check of those of those updates at any point. Um, as I say, we'll be sharing Ibrahim's contact information, so please do get in touch for any questions. And um, before we finish, though, Ibrahim, I want to say thank you so much uh, for today. Your, your, your knowledge is incredibly impressive um, and thank you so much for um, your time today and those insights um, really you know helpful and useful to our audience so we really appreciate it we hope we can see you again soon um, to do another one of these as you say with, with, with those updates that will be coming um, thank you very much to our audience as well um, for being with us and for your questions that you sent in um, I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day Ibrahim thank you very much again uh, and goodbye everyone Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. And thanks, uh, Mondak, for this lovely opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ibrahim. Have a good day, bro. Thank you.